Ever since 2009, Bitcoin has been on a rocket-fueled growth path and it's now infinitely larger than it was when it first came about. If you've seen any of our videos before, you've probably heard me say something along those lines already. And if you haven't, you've probably heard somebody else say it. But what exactly do we mean when we say Bitcoin has grown? Do we mean that it's somehow gotten physically bigger? And how would you even measure that? How much does a Bitcoin weigh? Bear with me on this one. <laughs> okay. It's a weird question, I know, Bitcoin's digital. But still, the question is more relevant than it seems. For instance, if I was to ask you how much does a penny weigh, that would be a pretty easy question to answer, assuming that you had a weighing scale handy. But what if I told you to put the penny on the scale without the metal that it's made of? Could you separate the penny from the coin? For instance, this is a 50 pence coin. If I was to give this to you and ask you to return me just the 50 pence without the metal, could you do that? It seems impossible, right? After all, the metal is the penny, right? Well, no. For instance, on the screen, I'm gonna put an image of a old 10 pound note. They used to be traded in the UK and until March 1st of 2018, they were legitimate 10 pound notes. Then on March the 1st of 2018, the government introduced new plastic notes. And now the old tenner is just a piece of paper. It is no longer 10 quid. But how much is it? No, for like, for real, how much are the old tenors worth today? Well, you can't do anything with the paper. They're relatively recent, so I can't imagine them having much collectible value. So they're probably worth next to nothing. That's because all of the value that the note held was based purely on its holder's confidence that others would want it and thus be willing to trade for it. This confidence-based value is called monetary premium, which is just a fancy term that describes any value that the thing has that isn't purely based on its usefulness as a material object for things other than trade. But why would people have confidence that others would want something that can't be used for anything outside of trade? When something becomes particularly useful for trade, lots of people will begin using it for exactly that, and it's from this popularity that we can be confident that others will want to trade for it. But what makes something good for trade? Like, what makes good money? When you picture good money, you probably will think of gold or silver coins, but you probably won't be thinking of alcohol, shells, or cows even though they've all been used as money in the past. And why have all of those things been used as money? Because they all have at least one of the properties of money. The properties of money are as follows. Durability, portability, divisibility, uniformity, limited supply, and acceptability. And the closer something gets to possessing all six of these qualities, the closer it gets to being considered perfect money. Gold was closer to perfect money than cows and alcohol and shells and Thus, it was the most commonly used form of money for most of human history. During this time, gold developed a huge monetary premium, that concept we were talking about earlier. When farmers sold their cows for gold, it wasn't because they wanted to make jewelry, it was so that they could trade that gold for something else later down the line. But still, it wasn't perfect. Why? Because although it had a limited supply, it was durable, divisible, uniform, and relatively acceptable, it wasn't portable enough. So people began more and more to deposit their gold into banks for paper receipts. And then they would start using these receipts as their form of trade rather than lugging around heavy bags of gold everywhere. Eventually we forgot gold altogether and just began using the receipts for trade. And this is why our 10 pound notes have any value at all today. But there's a catch. Paper notes are not limited in supply. You can print as many as you want. And governments have been doing that a lot. The number of United States dollars that exist today is 50 times the amount that existed just 50 years ago. That's not right. The number of United States dollars that exist today is 35 times the amount that existed just 50 years ago. And if you know anything about supply and demand, you know that this basically causes the actual value of those dollars to decrease hugely. And the same has been happening with other currencies all around the world. We've been searching for the perfect money for thousands of years. But can perfect money even exist in the real world? This is Plato. Plato was a pioneer of philosophy in ancient Greece, and one of his main ideas was that a perfect circle could only be described with maths. It could only exist in your mind, and you'll never find any perfect circles in reality. It seems that the same is also true of money. At least that was until computer networks came about. The language that they speak is maths. So with the invention of the computer and the internet, we can now describe the perfect money with code, just as you can describe the perfect circle with code. And we did, and it's called Bitcoin.
Bitcoin. <laughs> Bit, meaning information or properties, and coin, meaning money. Properties money. It's not that Bitcoin has the properties of money. It's that Bitcoin is the properties of money described in code. And code is not static, it's dynamic. You can interact with it and use it, unlike maths written down on a paper, for instance. And unlike the tenor, nobody can separate Bitcoin's value from the note, because there is no note. Bitcoin is value isolate. But how can Bitcoin be valuable if it doesn't exist in the material world? How can it be valuable if it doesn't weigh anything? Well, government-issued currencies don't weigh anything either. Our tenor is just a claim on £10. It's not £10 itself. And this is actually a note from the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe because apparently I'm in greater supply of these than I am of Great British Pounds. But the same thing is written on this as is written on pound sterling notes. And it says on it, if you look closely, I promise to pay the bearer on demand $200 million. Or usually in the case of our tenor, it would say £10. And I'll put an image up on the screen as well where it says this on the £5 note. However, if you were to send this note to the Bank of England and ask them to pay you what it promises that it will pay you on the note, which is £5, you will receive nothing because we forgot about gold. The note itself is not the pounds. In fact, this is true of most currencies around the world where the majority of the actual currency is not printed at all. It's just entries on a spreadsheet. It's primarily actually digital. But unlike Bitcoin, these currencies do not have limited supplies. That's why this Zimbabwe note is for $200 million. You can imagine just how much one Zimbabwe dollar is worth today if they have to put 200 million of them into a single note. And what problem is this a symptom of? A lack of limited supply, which is a problem that isn't just true of the Zimbabwe dollar, but also of the pound sterling and the United States dollar, and just about every major foreign exchange currency. And so the criticism that Bitcoin can't possibly hold value because it doesn't exist is not really the criticism at all. If it didn't exist, then we wouldn't be talking about it. So the criticism is often actually just that it doesn't exist as a material. It doesn't weigh anything, which seems to be a symptom of widespread misunderstanding about what money actually is. So, next time somebody says that Bitcoin doesn't exist, ask them to pull out a tenor and to pay you the tenor without giving you the paper, or the plastic now. If they just send it to you via bank transfer, that's just an entry on a spreadsheet, so congratulate them, I guess, because they just paid you with something that doesn't exist. And while you're on the same page about that, they may as well just send you the rest of the money that's in their bank account since they're so convinced that immaterial things cannot hold value. Either they send you all their money or one of their beliefs has to change. But they won't send you their money. Why not? For the same reason that Bitcoin is valuable despite being digital. Checkmate. That's empty. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> if you liked this video, be sure to subscribe and hit the like button. Leave a comment if you have any questions about anything that I said or if you think that something I said was stupid. Make sure you let me know down in the comments. We post videos just like this every week where we'll be tackling a new concept about Bitcoin and trying to break it down in the simplest and most understandable way without any of the technical jargon and, and whatnot. Uh, but other than that, thank you very much for watching. I feel like I should say something else, but I don't know what to say. <laughs>